Hello and welcome to Transformative Travel. I'm your host, Gary White, and with me today, as usual, is my wife and co-host, Ellen Aviva. Hi, Ellen. Hi. We have good weather here, so Ellen is back outside again. And you might even see the, the bougainvillea, which was infested with something, but has been uh, treated and is trying to come back to, uh, to its green it's glory this summer. Greening up a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, today we have a very special guest, uh, Cheryl Straffen. Can you tell us about Cheryl? Oh, I am so looking forward to our conversation with author, sacred sites researcher, ritual practitioner, and goddess lover, Cheryl Straffen. Cheryl spent the first 19 years of her life growing up in Cornwall before moving to London for coursework and postgraduate work at London University in Cambridge. She later returned to Cornwall and has spent the rest of her life mostly there and in Crete. She has written numerous books on topics, including megalithic mysteries, pagan Cornwall, Cornish folklore and fairy stories, holy wells, the earth goddess and the goddess in Crete. She formerly co-organized and facilitated the goddess in Cornwall events at well, as well as organizing rituals and ceremonies at the Glastonbury Goddess Conference. She currently vice chairs the charity Caspin which looks after ancient corner sites. Cheryl and her wife, Lana, an excellent dowser, continue to explore sacred sites in Cornwall and Crete, where they have homes, and also in Ireland and Malta. We, not homes, but exploration. We, we first met Cheryl in 2014, when she was our guide to a number of amazing sites in mid to South Cornwall, and we went dowsing with, with Lana and Cheryl, quite amazing memories. We later met up to celebrate the Midsummer Festival in Penzance, and just a few years ago, we met in Malta for the Spring Equinox. Just a brief reminder, uh, please let us know if you have questions or comments as we go. Uh, tap them into the uh, comments in the app, and this will be recorded. It will be available later on YouTube channel of uh, Gary White Transformational Travel. So, well, welcome, Cheryl. And I'd like to begin talking about how and when you first got involved in megalithic sites in those exciting days, your connection with John Mitchell, and uh, even your introduction to the goddess, whatever you'd like to start with. And thank you so much. For being Hello, here. Yilin. Hello, Gary. Hello, everybody uh, who's tuned in. Lovely to, uh, that you um, found the time to do so. Um, yeah, well, it's uh, getting on in a few okay. years now. So remembering back to my early days of connection with the megalithic sites and, and goddess uh, is winding back the clock quite a lot. Um, I think I've always, from an early age, been aware of the special nature and the spirituality um, of ancient sites. I remember as a child being taken to um, a sacred site down here in Cornwall, um, at Chisorster, and uh, um, one of the school days out, uh, and all the other kids were jumping all over the walls and having a great time. And I remember standing back and thinking, they shouldn't be doing this. I wasn't quite mm -hmm. sure why they shouldn't be doing this, but I had a kind of awareness that this was a special place, this was a sacred place although I didn't have the words to, to explain that. And I remember the next day, the uh, teacher at school um, talking about these sites and saying that they were constructed by the woe painted savages. And I remember sitting there thinking, she's not right. This is not right what I'm being told here. How I knew it wasn't right, I don't know, but I did. So that's my first memory, I suppose. Um, my second memory was um, traveling up to uh, London, where I went to university. Um, and in those days, long before the motorways were built, um, it was going up on, on uh, minor 
roads, one of which ran past Stonehenge. And in those days, you could just stop off and wander freely among the stones. And I always used to stop off and ask for the blessings of the spirits or the ancestors, whoever it was, um, that occupied the site uh, as I travelled on my way. Um, so th that's where it all began. Over the years, um, I really was drawn to many of these sites. Um, I, I still feel a thrill when I, when I go to an ancient site. Um, it still feels like it's something special, something to be connected to. Um, and I've been to many sites over Britain and Scotland and Wales and Ireland and also overseas in, in Brittany and as you mentioned, Water and Crete and, um, and so forth. Um, and there's always something special about, about these places. Um, and I suppose that the awareness for me of the spirituality of the places became enhanced from uh, the 1970s and 1980s onwards. Uh, as you said, Ellen, I did get to know John Michel uh, and others in the Earth Mysteries movement. Um, and that enhanced my, my knowledge and my understanding, and my connection to these places. Um, and in the, the 1990s and in, into the new millennia, um, I particularly became uh, connected to the idea that many of the uh, cultures and civilizations that built these sites um, were goddess celebrating the people. Um, so I did a lot of research on, around that area. I wrote books around it. I edited a magazine, Goddess Alive. Um, and um, I suppose my connection to, to goddess became partly study, academic, reclaiming the goddess from these ancient civilizations, but also very personal. Uh, it was my spiritual path and my, my um, feeling, my awareness um, that many of these, these sites uh, were built by cultures who were goddess celebrating or aware of the, um, the force in the universe that they named the goddess uh, has been instrumental in, in my spiritual development as well. So it's a long answer to a, to a question. No, it's a short answer. I'm sure we could talk about it for a lot longer in much more detail. But, but at least that sets, sets the stage that you intuitively sensed and were aware of the power of these places. And as you experienced more and more of them, and uh, I mean, you, you speak very, very humbly about your, your role in all of this, but you have written so many books. I think we have a composite of maybe all of them, but uh, uh, sure so many again. books, you have been so instrumental in uh, megalithic mysteries of Cornwall and uh, the the pagan uh, pagan Cornwall, the the daughters of the earth, the earth goddess, the the energies that are within the land. Uh, and for years, I've been getting your quarterly uh, magazine on uh, on sacred sites in Cornwall and have appreciated that very much. And now Crete as well. So maybe we should. Um, go on and you know explore in detail some of these wonderful sites that we've been to with you and uh i think the first one we have is uh is is bole bole fugu right yep, yep indeed it's the cover um of my pagan cornwall book one of the first books i wrote um that was important to me um i think because uh many of the histories and prehistories that I read and studied about Cornwall were all about um, conflict and warfare between different tribes. Um, and it's one way of interpreting prehistory based on the archaeology of these places, but I felt it wasn't the only way. And my feeling was that the people who lived um, in the communities down here uh, back into the uh, Neolithic and the early Bronze Age, um, the people when they first settled in this land, um, were probably 
uh, not at war with each other all the time. Um, and I felt that they probably lived, and the archaeological evidence seemed to show this, um, very cooperative lifestyles by and large, you know, there were tribal differences, um, but people had a different uh, concept. Um, uh, they had a different concept of the land and uh, of, um, like many people living the Neolithic lifestyles, they would take from the land only what they needed um, and uh, they would um, uh, operate they would live in harmony uh, with the land. And I felt that the cultures um, of the societies who lived here in the Neolithic and Bronze Age uh, were much more peace-loving, much more cooperative, um, much less aggressive, much less hierarchical than they were often portrayed. And that was my real motivation behind writing Peyton Cornwall. It wasn't that nobody had written about uh, Cornwall and it's prehistory many many people had mm -hmm. and some of the research was very good uh, but there was a different way of interpreting it mm -hmm. and I'm kind of proud a bit since then uh, to say that you know not everybody would agree with my interpretations and that's fair enough you know we all have diff different approaches to things um, but nobody's been able to fault the uh, information the facts the research that I did for the book um, and from my perspective that it, you know it's a different way of looking at our prehistory um and certainly the further you go back the more i think people were um, respectful um around the earth the more people had a concept that the earth was their mother who supplied them with everything they might need for the tribe for the food and, and, and for the resources uh, and they honored her as a result of that um so my Peyton Cornwall Land of the Goddess book, it's, um, it's gone through a lot of reprints and I'm very proud and pleased about that. But I'm more proud and pleased that um, it may have touched people and made them think about uh, our ancestors in a different kind of way. So this cover is a co shows a picture of um, one of our sites, Belay Pugu. These are underground sites. Um, uh, they date from a later period of the Iron Age. Um, but, you know, for, for me, we still don't know exactly what the purpose of the sites was, but we do know that for uh, prehistoric peoples going into the underworld, either into a cave or into an artificially constructed cave, which is what a fugu is, was a journey into another world. It was a journey into a sacred space. Um, some archaeologists, not in print though, personally to me, have suggested they were very much women's places that mm -hmm. women would go perhaps at times of menstruation or to give birth um and um that you know this was part of their function and purpose we don't know for certain but it's certainly a possibility what we do say can say for certain is that um going into uh, um, a subterranean space uh, was a liminal experience where you went from the outside world of daylight and light and movement and activity into a pace, place for quietness, for meditation, for connection with the earth spirit uh, and the mother goddess. So, so that people have a sense of this, this is a long corridor and uh, the Fugus are long underground tunnels, corridors. Yeah. And then there's they often wind around. We went to one with you in Pendeen I yes, think yes, had a, yes. a window at the uh, an opening at the end that overlooked the waters, yeah. and then there's often another um, side, uh, another a chamber to the side. Yeah, yeah um, And I, we've been in these, and they are just incredibly powerful. So when I'm told they might have been root cellars, which makes no sense because they get wet, mm -hmm. and or places where people would you know run for for hiding, which mm -hmm. also would mean they were trapped. But you, you just, they have this sense to them when you're inside of them. You're yeah. going down into the earth. And uh, there, I think this one, doesn't Boulay have a carving, a faded carving on one of the stones? Possibly, um, yeah. there's some argument about that, whether it okay. does or not. Um, but, you know, all of them, 
according to the research of, of uh, somebody down here, Ian Cook, all the, of the passages of the Buddha's paint point in a excuse me, northeast direction, which is the direction of the um, midsummer solstice sunrise. Um, and putting all this sort of stuff together, um, I came up with the idea, many of them, as you say, in, in her side passages, and incidentally, you wrote very, very powerfully uh, about uh, these voodoo's in a couple of articles that um, were reprinted in my magazine, May Membra. So ah, you have definitely that's a, right. a very Thank powerful you. connection with them. Um, so the, the concept that I have, um, uh, for instance, one of our voodoo's, uh, Carnuni, which is still intact uh, with its side passage, its creep, was that perhaps at both ends of the voodoo were sealed. So perhaps at, um, the night before the midsummer solstice, um, people would have uh, entered the Fugu by the creek passage. They may have spent the night in there. Um, they may have um, undergone some, some form of ritual or ceremony that might have involved um, reaching an altered state of consciousness, perhaps through drumming uh, or perhaps fasting, perhaps even the ingestion of um, psychotropic substances. Um, to attain all the states of consciousness, because we know that prehistoric people did this, and, and many tribes right. still do it today in various parts of the world. Um, and um, uh, at the moment of the rising of the sun at the, uh, at the solstice, which was a very important moment because it was the longest day, um, perhaps um, there was a movable stone at the entrance of Fugu, similar to the one, for instance, at Newgrange in Ireland, and that would have let the first rays of the sun shine into the darkness of the Fugu. It would have been a very powerful spiritual, magical moment mm -hmm. uh, for this to happen. Um, yeah, just, yeah. Yeah, just seeing this, I'm reminded of some of the experiences we had. I mean, with you and Pendine, walking, you know, crawling backwards down this very steep entrance, and then sitting towards the back and then a cold breeze came through. I mean, there was all kinds of things that were just like, I know this is a place where you become very altered. And uh, it was just a very sacred, transformative experience. Yeah, yeah it's funny you should say that because um, I remember um, going back some now, but for my 50th birthday, I was with a group of friends and we went to a food group locally here in Cornwall, Haligi Fugu. And it's my birthday happened to coincide with the night of a full moon, but not only a full moon, an eclipse full moon as well. Um, <laughs> and we went down the Fugu and, and we did some chanting and you know and, and we did some quiet meditating. Um, and then I went up into the long creek passage. Um, which you can only reach on your hands and knees. I probably couldn't do it today, but I, you know, this, is, <laughs> this is going back. Um, and I crept up to the end of the passage, uh, and the others left the fugu and stood outside and, and were chanting, um, chanting my name and also chanting um, uh, other sacred words as well, while they waited for the full moon to rise. Um, and uh, when the time was felt right, I crawled backwards down the creek passage. So it was like a, a, a total rebirth, really, um, uh, into the main body of the Fugu. And as I emerged from the Fugu, um, the full moon uh, eclipsed, uh, it oh, rose wow. eclipsed. So it was a deep orange color, had just risen, which was shining straight into the entrance of the Fugu. You know, it's, it's, it's a good way to, to um, spend your 50th birthday. Oh, wow. It uh, certainly sticks in my mind. It's one of my most wow. spiritual experiences uh, I've had. And, and these places are still available for these experiences. We're, we'll come back, uh, well, we'll touch again on the whole question of the alignments. That's going to be a thread throughout these photos that we see um, about the intentional placement of the openings. Uh, with regard to to the this um, to the equinoxes or sometimes the solstices, um, mm -hmm. we well we could talk a long time about fugus. I poof, but let's we should probably get on to the next slide. Uh, Bas Basquen Basquenun, yeah, Basquenun. This oh. is one of the most um, 
uh, beautiful stone circles I think we have down here in West Cornwall consists of 19 stones uh, as indeed do many if not most if not all of the stone circles down here in West Cornwall um, and it also has the addition of a center stone uh, which you can see in the in the picture there a leaning center stone um, and again we there's nothing written from this period when these sites were built um, late Neolithic early Bronze Age so uh, we have to try and infer what the meaning of these places uh, could be um, I've always thought that there was a significance in the fact that nearly all of them, the Merry Maidens, Boscanoon, uh, Tregus Seal, um, the Nine Maidens, uh, Men and Toll, possibly originally, probably <laughs> had 19 stones. And why 19? It why 19? Yeah. yeah. They seem to me, um, it wasn't a coincidence that they all had 19 stones. Um, now, uh, we know that the ancient peoples were perfectly capable of, of observing the passage of the sun and the moon around the sky. Of course, they were much closer to it. They weren't locked away in, in, in buildings. Um, so uh, they could very easily see um, these cycles of sun and moon. And we know this from um, many ancient sites, not only in Cornwall, but all over um, Britain uh, and, and Brittany as well, and Ireland. Uh, that many of the the sites were aligned to significant times and passages of the sun and the moon. Uh, and one of those cycles um, is the uh, standstill cycle of the moon. Which is 18.6 um, yeah. years, or 19 to the nearest. Yeah. Um, and there's also another cycle um, which combines, interestingly, the passage of the sun in the sky and the moon in the sky, and it's called the Metonic Cycle. And that takes precisely 19 years to return to its original place in the sky. Um, now, the ancient peoples are perfectly capable of observing this, of seeing this, and of incorporating it into, into their sites. And in different parts of the country, they did this in different ways. There's a whole series of stone circles called recumbent stone circles up in uh, Aberdeenshire in northeast Scotland, um, which we visited a few years ago. Um, and they've all got um, two upright stones uh, in the circle with a horizontal one between the two uprights. Um, and this is very much a viewing frame. Um, and they, they used it for viewing the rising and setting of the moon. Um, and by the research of Aubrey Burl, um, uh, and also reviewed by Clive, Clive Ruggles, both archaeoastronomers, um, they realized that this viewing frame um, could be uh, used to see the rising and setting of the moon at the standstill uh, every 18.6 years. So the ancient peoples knew how to do this. And there's also this, this amazing uh, stone circle, Kalanich, on the Isle of Lewis. Oh, we, yes. we were there for we the, were there for the standstill. For the standstill. Stand for the, for the stand and I you were too, we weren't you? We saw you. <laughs> yeah, we didn't know you then. We didn't know you at the time. <laughs> it was 2000, <laughs> 2000, the last one was 2006. Six. Yeah, in June. And it was freezing cold and it was. Yeah. Uh, rainy, sleety. And we didn't and... know whether we'd see the moon or not. No. Um, but no. Of course, you might not have been there the same month as we were. We were there in June, I think it was. We were there in June. Yeah, you were, you were, we, were, we were all standing there. We were, oh, we were all standing, we were all standing there. there. We were, I think you were sitting in a place of honor, but we were standing on the side going, <laughs> yeah. what is this well, about? What's going on? We here? were in the circle and we weren't sure if we'd see the moon, but actually yeah. she did eventually come up. Uh, and the significance of this place is, as, as you both know, um, that there's a, a neighboring uh, hill, um, part of a mountain range, um, called the Sleeping Beauty in English. I wanted to attempt the Gaelic pronunciation. I'm not a Gaelic speaker. Um, but in, in English, it's called the Sleeping Beauty or Sleeping Goddess. Um, and uh, at the time of the standstill, um, the moon rises, of course, at the lowest point in the horizon. And year upon year, it rises slightly higher till it gets to 9.3 years and then another 9.3 come back down again. Um, so every 18.6 years, it rises very low on the horizon, fringes the horizon. Um, and of course, up at, uh, at Kalanish, 
um, we can see uh, the moon rise over the um, the legs of this Sleeping Beauty effigy in, in, in the hills. It's the hill itself, but it looks like a sleeping woman um, in the hill. And, uh, and the moon rises and it runs across her legs. And as it starts to rise higher in the sky, uh, it comes across her belly and eventually ac across her breasts. Um, and then after a, sh a short pause, it shines directly down into the, the stone circle itself, into the center of the circle. Um, I remember we saw some of that. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, and it was a really magical sight. And so the ancient peoples knew about this standstill phenomenon. And they put perfectly able to. Um, yes, the moon uh, appeared to almost set and rise again because <laughs> it was of the hill being there. On the other yeah. side. Yeah. It, it was amazing. Yes, it, 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 it rose and ran up her body and, and then yes. over the hill it disappeared behind it. And then yeah. it reappeared again, it shone into the, into the stone circle. So these ancient peoples were aware of this, these two cycles, this standstill lunar standstill cycle and this metonic cycle um and he, I'm, going to say one more, I'm going to say one more thing about that yeah. because i'm remembering that because since we're talking about transformation and clearly it was important what three thousand years ago four thousand years ago and it is still because people are go we are going there to yeah. see what this experience was and to experience it ourselves and when we were there along with the drumming and the chanting that was honoring this event there was also wait a second honey i'm sorry there was, yeah just a sec there was also the um a, a choir uh because scotland and the islands are extremely uh traditional conservative uh christian in many ways and there was this choir from some very conservative christian organization that was singing uh christian hymns uh in in sort of to counteract the the, all the of power us of the, 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 the rest of us there, <laughs> yeah. Oh, I I well remember. They started to sing "Amazing Grace," and I went over and joined them, and I, I sang "Amazing Grace" with them. <laughs> well, so yeah, even a pagan joined them to uh, to sing "Amazing Grace." They, they were quite taken aback. I, I, I thought at least it was a recognition by them of the spiritual force of these places. Yes, and exactly. They yes. knew that these, yes. these, these places were powerful long before Christianity. Yes. Uh, and that they're still and they powerful. And they continue to be powerful today. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so they're trying to counter it. Okay, yeah. so that was a, a good so, Do yeah. you want to say? So the, the so standstill bus? and the Metonic cycle okay. is represented by 18.6 or 19. Uh, I don't think it's okay. crazy. The stone circles in West yeah. Cornwall also have 19 stones. Um, it's, it was their way of expressing that possibility. So uh, back to Boscanu, or are we? Boscanu, we yeah. There are other things to talk about at Boscanu. Yeah. Okay. That center stone, uh, it, it's almost center. It's just slightly off center, um, but I think it's off center for a particular reason, and I think it leans for a particular reason. I don't think it's um, it's fallen over because the earliest engravings uh, of it, you know, back in the 17th century, show it in a leaning position. Um, and uh, it's been discovered that on the underside of the um, of, of the uh, stone, the, this is the sanding stone in the centre there. Um, there are carvings, um, and originally it was thought they were car axe axe carvings, um, which wouldn't um, be uh, surprising because we know that the prehistoric people were traded in that in axes, particularly greenstone axes, which you can get down here in Cornwall. It was one of their primary trading tools um, they were ceremonial axes I think um, uh, but recently um, some more detailed analysis has been done on it um, and uh, the suggestion now is they are actually feet carving um, uh, and we know from one or two other sites including one in Brittany that there were also feet carved um, on, on that particular site too so that may have had some significance that we don't fully understand now um but there are possibly two feet or two axe carvings and above those carvings it's been suggested that there are two uh, breast uh, nipple carvings as well um and of course when they came out with that result i, I wasn't as 
quite a bit surprised because I thought if that's the case, this is like uh, perhaps many of the sites in Brittany, which also show show breast carvings mm -hmm. um, and were um, carvings probably done in honor of the Earth Mother, the, the Mother Goddess. Mm -hmm. So, you know, these sites still throw up interesting things. You, and, you know, with modern technology, we're beginning to learn uh, new things about these places. Yeah. You know, um, and one of the wonderful yeah. things about traveling in Cornwall with you or on your own is that these places, they are protected in the sense that your work with Caspen, for example, and people care about these sites and, and they, they, they are protected in many different ways different ways but you're able to access them they're not behind gates and and uh they're not behind fences and uh you can only access with uh permission from the the local uh national trust or something like that i mean some are but a lot of them you can go to yeah, they're, well, out actually, in the, they're out in the countryside actually if you go to Boscanoon, i believe it's still this way there is now a high hedge all the way around it well, yeah, yeah, yes and no. Um, the the thing is, um, most places in the land are owned by somebody. Um, people talk about common land. There's very little that isn't actually owned by somebody. Um, and unless there's a public footpath going to the site, for instance, at our Mary Maidenstone circles, a public footpath going right across the middle of the site, which is mm -hmm. great it gives you a right away for access okay. unless okay. there's a public footpath you don't actually have a right uh, you have to ask permission of the landowner okay but for most of our sites um, down here um, uh, it's not an issue um, m mostly there um, the landowner is fine about it um, or as you say they might be owned by the National Trust to provide pre access or we now have um, uh, you know, something called Countryside Rights of Way, uh, Crow Access, which allows uh, people um, to access certain areas of our countryside without needing to seek permission for it. Um, and yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, I, I overspoke. I made it look yeah, too, legally. too open. Yeah. It's well, not I know, free, it and like <laughs> Bole Fugu, the first slide we showed, and I'm horrified to realize we're only on slide two. Uh, but the first slide we show, um, that's at Rosemarin Farm, I think. And there is a, a very large B&B uh, &B there and a house. And you need to call ahead to get permission to see yeah. it because it's on private land. But they do give permission. Yes. They're very good. We have to be staying at that B&B. &B, so yeah. we had access to that Fugu. Yeah. 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 It, oh, it's amazing. But I mean, I knew the owner of that place he no longer owns it he sold it but joe may and he's written a book about it called fugu which is fascinating yes. it and is that, i've read that it's just like you know oh. it some of his Oof. experiences in oh, the book, uh, how he communicated with the spirits of the place uh -huh. uh, how he thought that it was a circle of women who were, were guardians of, of this place um and uh, also you know he used to have um uh, alternative gatherings there it was called mm -hmm. care Center of Alternative Education and Research, um, and how some of the people who, who came on those courses um, had very powerful experiences uh, down in, in that Fugu. But they, these places are still alive as long as we still visit them and care about them. And, and treat them. them with respect. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And respect them. That's the most important thing of all. You know, we spent a lot of, we go back to Cornwall again and again and again. And I used to say, I don't think I could live here for long, though, because it's so permeable with spirit. It's like, yeah. it's like, it's not a, it, it is a thin place. It's like, yes. but okay. So we should get on to Chung, Chung Khoi. Yeah. Um, and a Khoi is like just, a dolmen. Just, yeah, I'm just going to say about oh, sorry. Uh, Bale Fugu um, before yeah. we move on, just briefly. Um, many people who do go down, you know, these sites and others, um, have um, uh, experiences um, which are, are time moving, time shifting um, yes. experiences. Um, you know, the veil between the worlds is sometimes very thin in places like this. Um, and uh, sometimes I get to hear about these and people tell me about them. Uh, and I always remember at Belay Pugu, there was one person who went down there and 
uh, they, they wanted to go and see it and they um, I used to work in the library as a just and people would often come in and ask me about things so I, I told them where it was and how to get down there and they came back about a week later and I said you know did you get down there how did you find it and uh, she said well, well I went down there all right she said shame I couldn't get in I said, I couldn't get in. Why couldn't you get in? Well, she said, the great big stones across the entrance, blocking the entrance. I, oh. I couldn't get in. Oh. And I said, well, I, I didn't say very much, but I said, oh, <laughs> right. Um, yeah, there certainly used to be, but back in the time it was built, 2,000 right. years oh, ago. Oh, my gosh. They, so them. she had slipped a bit. And it's been open ever since. It's been yeah. open in, since the recorded time. Um, and there is an old engraving which does show big stones across the entrance of it, but this is hundreds, hundreds of years old, this, this engraving. Um, mm. And it's certainly always open now, as you know, because you, you yeah. saved it. Yeah. But she obviously experienced some kind of time shift on it wow. when she got to it. And I often wondered, now why did she have that experience? Mm -hmm. Was she perhaps not ready to go down into mm -hmm. it? And perhaps was the Guru saying to her, you're not ready yet. Not yet. Yeah. Not um, yeah. Not, not, now. not your time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there's yeah. another one, a, a different poodle at Khan Uni, um, oh, yes. where a woman got in touch, touch with me because she picked up a copy of my magazine uh, and said um, she's not mystical at all. She'd never had any uh, strange experiences. But she went down to Khan Uni and was at the entrance of the poodle and was sketching away at the entrance. Um, and um, and she looked up and she saw the courtyard house settlement as it must have been when it was built you know, oh. two and a half, three thousand years ago um, because there were people looking out of the window uh, and walking about and doing the things that they would do um, and, and the site was, was complete um, and she saw children or a child looking out of one of the windows and the child saw her. None of the other people in the thing did but the child saw her um, and um, uh, so, you know, we know that children often have psychic experiences at a young age before, yeah, yeah. before they grow. Um, and she certainly had had some kind of altered state of consciousness. Um, she said oh. that her feeling about it was incredibly peaceful. Um, she felt that it was a very, very peaceful. And um, people, when they go there nowadays, say that it's got a lovely, peaceful atmosphere. Can't you need? Um, oh. But she wrote to me because she, she was a bit freaked by this and said, well, I've never had anything like this before. Do you know what this is about? You know, and I, I just said, well, I could make Gary, it. I think I, three, I, three slides down is Kern Uni. Yeah, we can talk more about that. Why don't we just, that. we can just get there right now since you're talking about it. And yeah, then we'll no, go back worry. to. No, no. That's okay, well, just go back where you were. Yeah. Go back where you were, sweetie. There you go. Yeah, that's, that's Kern Uni. Yeah. That's Kern Uni. Yeah, um, it has the fugu, um, uh -huh. and it has a beehive hut attached to, to the fugu, and at the back of the um, beehive hut, which is what this slide shows, there is a, a deliberate um, niche, um, and uh, we're not sure what the niche is for. It, obviously, it wasn't a chimney. It doesn't lead to the top of the fugu, a uh, top of the beehive hut. Um, so my feeling is that this niche um, was a place where they placed offerings. Um, the, uh, the the photo shows uh, um, uh, a goddess figurine um, that I placed in, in there for the sake of the photo. But the original beehive hut, um, its entrance was aligned to the midwinter solstice sunrise. Um, so if it had been a place where they put offerings uh, into this niche, the rising sun at the midwinter solstice would have shone straight into the beehive hut and illuminated this niche. Um, mm at the end and illuminated anything that they put there as an offering. So it may well have been seen as a, a blessing um, from the spirit world or the ancestors and, or the goddess uh, and, and, on, on their offerings. And for those who don't know, the, the winter solstice is the longest, the shortest day and the longest night. That's it right. says the summer is the longest day and the shortest night. That's exactly right. Okay. The, um, the, the ancient peoples were, um, aware of these times of the year, these significant times, and there were both the solstices, as you mentioned, Ellen, and, uh, and the equinoxes, which we'll perhaps come on to <laughs> later, or maybe yes, not. well, hopefully. We yeah. out of time. Um, should we go back to Chuncoit then? Mm -hmm. So yep. this is what we would call a dolmen, but in, in yeah. Cornwall you call them coits. Yes, dolmen, Correct? coits, yeah. cornlicks. Um, okay. 
Connick's the Welsh name. They're, they're all this, um, found all over, um, uh, well, not only Cornwall, Wales, Ireland, Brittany, and some in Turkey, as well. Turkey, Russia. Yeah, yeah. 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 There's an um, amazing book uh, called Dolmens of the Dead, which um, is an illustration of dolmens found all over the world. It oh, seems wow. to be a basic um, building structure, a number of uprights uh, with a capstone placed on top. And these um, uh, dolmens, certainly here in, in Britain, were the earliest sites to be built. Uh, if we go back to the time when um, uh, Britain had separated from, from Europe um, and the area in between was sort of swamp land, now known generally as Dogger Bank, um, uh, up until that time, people had ranged freely over um, Europe and Britain. Uh, these were the uh, Mesolithic people um, who followed the game ac ac across these vast um, uh, lands. Um, but uh, uh, around um, 5000 uh, BCE, um, they uh, started to um, uh, adopt a different kind of lifestyle. Um, the uh, farming ha had been uh, discovered. Um, in the Fertile Crescent um, of, of the Near East and uh, the idea of farming and, and, and crop um, planting and animal rearing, rearing had spread uh, across Europe in a westerly direction uh, and when it got to, to Britain and to, to, into Cornwall then uh, people began to settle down um, and they began to build communities. And if we go back in time to that time, we must think of uh, the whole of the land um, being open and free because this is where they followed the herds. Um, but then they began to mark out their territory for the first time. So these were the first dwellings of people when they didn't lead a peripatetic lifestyle, but they started to settle. Um, and when they started to settle, then they started to plant the crops in the fields and they started to, to domesticate the animals and the herds. And they had more time on their land, uh, on their hand. And they were also uh, living in the one place. They weren't moving following, following the animal herds. Um, and then they began to start to build the megalithic monuments that we see all around us today. And the first megalithic monuments they built uh, were the Quoits before anything else. Uh, so you've got to imagine a landscape with no stone circles, no sanding stones, no, you know, no courtyard house settlements or fugus or anything. Um, uh, just small groups of people settling, um, domesticating, um, raising crops, uh, raising animals and planting crops. And then they went and started building. And the first things they built were the quoits. Uh, and they built them on the slopes of the hills um, not usually on the highest point, but near the highest point uh, on the slopes of the hills. And um, uh, we think, uh, the current thinking is, uh, though nobody's quite certain, uh, is that they were covered by a mound up to the capstone on the top. But the capstone was visible. And um, they were excarnation um, mounds, so that when somebody died, um, their body was placed on top of the capstone with the carrying birds um, to pick the flesh clean. Uh, mm -hmm. When this had been done, the bones of the dead were then taken down into the um, capstone, into the court itself. Um, and I think at this period in time, um, there was a sense of communality um, rather than individuality. Um, people all belonged to um, the same thing, they belong to the earth and they belong to, to the mother goddess. Um, and so these bones were mingled in together uh, in these places. And sometimes certain bones were taken out because they were <coughs> excuse me, thought to be significant. Others were put, placed in to replace them. Um, and uh, it was thought to be a communal place of the spirit of their ancestors. Uh, and my guesses that uh, in all the tribes there were spiritual leaders 
um, that we call nowadays sh shamans or shamankas for women. Um, and they still, many tribes all over the world who live Neolithic or Stone Age lifestyles still have shamans or shamankas um, in their tribe. And their role is to communicate with the ancestors and with the spirits. Um, often for very practical purposes, you know, somebody's sick in the tribe and they need a cure for it. So they'll go and talk to the ancestors, spirits, the ancestors, to find out what the cure is. Mm -hmm. Animals are, are sick and so they need to know how to look after them. So the uh, shamans and shamankas are the spiritual ambas ambassadors of the tribe, um, their connection between this world and the other world, um, and they will go on spirit journeys to, to contact um, these, these people. And my thinking is probably these places, these coins were the places where the, the, the shamans and shamankas would go because they were the places where the bones of the ancestors lay, mm -hmm. um, and they would then go on to spirit journeys through some of the reasons we talked about before. Um, drum chanting, past ingestion of psychotropic substances, and they would yeah. go on spirit journeys to connect with the spirits of the ancestors and come yes, back. We have, yeah. we have been to many of these uh, dolmen and quoits, and some of them still have uh, a bit of the mounding around them. Mm -hmm. In yeah. fact, there are a few that that uh, that the mound is is intact. Mm -hmm. So the uh, the idea that they had earth mounds around them uh, is pretty well uh, documented by the evidence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's certainly possible, Gary, that they, they did. And even if they didn't, they could have still gone to these places for yeah, right. journeys to meet with right. the ancestors. Yeah. And you had a second one of. Uh, I think we can talk about the sun sunset. Sunrise. Oh yeah, um, I don't think we've got the slide, but anyway, um, there. Uh, that that slide is some um, summer solstice sunset. But um, I, I did discover some years ago that Chungkoi had been deliberately placed where it was in order to view the winter solstice sunset, and ah. the sun sets in a notch on a neighbouring hill, Kankanijak. And it sets exactly into that notch uh, at the winter solstice. And I thought this is probably not a coincidence. Um, not coincidence. If, if you go a few yards one way or a few yards the other, it wouldn't happen. Um, but it happens at precisely that spot. I think these sites were used for, for multiple purposes. I think they were possibly used for observing the suns and the moons. I think they were used because um, there we haven't talked about energies, but I think there are energies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um uh, in the land which dowsers can pick up on I mean Gary would know all about <laughs> this um and um some of these sites may have been positioned um because uh they stand on significant places mm -hmm. of energy mm -hmm. um, so it may be a combination of, of various things I think that the people who built these places didn't just lock them up any any old way no. they were very careful yeah in the places that they chose to put them um, and they were also much more in tune with the energies of the land uh, and the passage of the, uh, of the sun and the moon and the stars th than we are um, they were much closer they were more sensitive to it uh, i mean they didn't have things like geiger counters to check the energy yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, as we do nowadays um, but um, uh, and we have checked some of the sites with them and there are some interesting results which um, maybe we'll talk about and, yeah. and on, but um, yeah. they, they certainly intuitively, instinctively um, felt um, the energies of these places, just as a, a dowser would. Um, I just want to say one more thing about about the the dolmens and think we we've been to a lot of them in Cornwall, uh, in uh, Catalonia, and in Spain and other places where you know they don't find uh, bones, which may be because they have deteriorated in the acidic soil or maybe that mm -hmm. those were used for these other purposes you're talking about we've yeah. traveled with um earth energy experts who you know and gary who can douse the lines and mm -hmm. i remember one in particular we were we were told it was really used to create a sort of energetic field over the fields nearby to help make them more productive and yeah. more harmonious by harmonizing the energies of the place yeah, yeah. I, I do think often find uh, a line that runs through the dolmen, 
uh, like r right through the entrance into the back, mm. as if the whole thing had been lined up that way, or uh, the energies accumulated there over the the millennia, which is also th something that does happen. Well, that's right. right. That the, the light moved towards, towards the, isn't it? You know, exactly. The energies there, and they built the site because the energies were there, and or. Um, was the fact that people came to these on a regular basis, that people might go to a church nowadays, exactly. um, uh, help to create um, sacred pathways and sacred connection to the sites, uh, yes. and, and therefore that enhanced the, the energy. So you can pick up. And also, you know, were these sites deliberately placed um, for uh, astronomical purposes? I mean, where, where you folks live in, in Portugal, um, I think I'm allowed to say that, am I? How are you going to say with the yes. people? Um, yes. Uh, uh, some research has been done by archaeo astronomers that, that many of the dolmens, you have a lot of dolmens in Portugal, yes. yes. um, are all facing um, in a, a easterly direction. Yes. Um, and the theory is that they're, they're designed particularly to focus on the rising sun be, between. Uh, the winter solstice and the summer solstice and, and back again. Um, so some, you know, scientific research has been done on that. So I, I think for these these people, it was a combination of, of all of these things. Uh, they yes. were aware of the energy yes. of the place. They they wanted to connect with the um, the, the movement and the stars and the sun and the moon. Um, and they were places that they could connect with the other world. Um, one of my books is called Between the World, Between the Realms, and it's about the connection that, that I think that the prehistoric peoples made um, with the other world, um, because the other world was ever present to them. You know, we separate everything out in our world. We we have practical things that we do, and then we have spiritual things that we do. It wasn't like that in prehistoric mm -hmm. times. The practical and the spiritual uh, was all part of the same continuum. Um, and they were very aware that there was this other world um, where the gods and goddesses and the ancestors and other spirits uh, lived. Um, and they were able to, to access these places at certain times of the year or in certain circumstances. Um, the world of spirit and, and, and the world of the here and now um, were intimately linked together to these people. And I think they're and we can still travel to some of these yes, places indeed. at the yeah. right time yeah. of year yeah. and experience something like what they did, although we're not, we're not them. Yeah. And yeah. we have a very different way of being in the world, including our <laughs> iPhones that tell us what direction the thing is facing. Yeah. But um, yeah, yeah. When, when we're yeah. not, there, we don't know what rituals they actually did, mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't matter in a sense uh, because we're connecting with them in our own particular mm -hmm. ways, um, just as they did. Um, and it, our way of connecting with them keeps these, these sites alive, spiritually. It's interesting that we brought up the concept of time, because <laughs> as a matter out. of fact, we have about eight minutes left. <laughs> okay, well, well I'm, going to, yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to assume we're going to continue this next next week, yep. right? Yeah, Fine, so we'll, we'll be coming back next Sunday to talk more about all of the the topics we won't have gotten to yet. Um, oh, and I also wanted to say your books are are almost all available on Amazon. If people are interested, just look for yeah. Cheryl Straffen. Sure. Do a search for Cheryl Straffen and you'll find them. Yeah. Uh, and also on your website, which Gary will post towards the end. Yeah. Uh, so, and I think you had another, well, well, let's see. Should we go on to Men Atoll? Okay. We should we do, do that? what we can do. Cheryl, are you... Or do you want to, I think she just froze. I believe she did freeze. Okay, so while she's frozen, she will, I think, come out and come back. Uh, so that is her website, Main Mambro. And there she is. Hello, um, you're still here. Uh, thank you. So if you go to that, you can subscribe to her, her uh, quarterly publication, but you can also see other, other resources that are available. Uh, including, and if you wanted to get in contact with Cheryl, I'm, I'm wasting our last five minutes here, but uh, just to put that up, that is info at, and that would be a way to contact Cheryl. Okay, so should we get on to Men on Toll, or, yeah? I can put it Try up to and get we can get more? as far as we get. <laughs> yeah, 
Okay, again, uh, one of our sites here, unique site because it's two uprights and a hold stone. Many people are very aware of this this site. Um, the interesting thing I think is perhaps many people aren't aware of is that our local archaeological unit cleared this ground and did a survey of the site some years ago uh, and discovered that they thought it was part of an original stone circle because they can see uh, another couple of the stones from the stone circle and also th there are post holes where they can see stones originally stood and, and they thought some of the stones were still buried and I remember saying to the archaeologists at the time, well, that's interesting, it could be a stone circle. Any idea how many stones there might have been in the stone circle? She said, yeah, we was about 19. Oh, <laughs> there you go. There you go. Uh, here's another 19 stone circle. But what makes this one unique, of course, is the hold stone. And uh, we did some um, uh, research on that. Um, and... Um, uh, one of our local researchers down here, Andy Northbrook, um, ran possible alignments through a computer program for the time that this site was built. And he discovered that if the stone, the whole stone had been at right angles to where it is now um, and had been in the uh, centre of the circle, rather than as part, part of it at the edge now, um, the uh, whole stone would have lined up with the maximum uh, summer moon, uh, moonrise um which goes back to the the moon stands to right, right. so people who built oh. this this um site um could have looked through the hole in the whole stone and see the, the full moon rising and skirting the horizon um at the, the standstill period so that would be a, a very dramatic site um and to give a sense of the size, you can crawl through mm -hmm. that hole. You can crawl through it, and there are lots of legends about what, mm -hmm. why you should crawl through it. If you've got a backache, or what it used to be called crick of any kind, um, and you crawl through the hole of stone, it's supposed to help heal that. There's also a legend that if you put a brass pin on top of the stone, um, according to how it moves, it will answer uh, any question. Um, which is like divination. It's also mm -hmm. like what you can do with dowsing, obviously. Um, and uh, I think that some of these these legends arose out of the nature uh, of the material that these stones were built out of. They're built out of granite, um, and granite um, has a, a piezoelectric effect. Um, that is, it can give off small electric charges. Um, and people have experienced, um, for instance, at the Mary Maidenstone Circle, getting a tingle off the stone uh, because that's the piezoelectric effect of it. Mm. Um, and we, we know that, um, that in, in healing nowadays, um, uh, sometimes um, healing is, is um, undergone by, by um, giving you a radi radiation therapy small short bursts of, of radiation mm -hmm. and maybe that's what was going on with places like this yeah. people crawling through the whole stone will get a short sharp burst of, of radiation off yeah. the stone because it's we know easy to it's easy to dismiss folklore and say oh it's just a story but folklore has some kernels of truth in it absolutely yeah uh, yes. so it's best to listen to folklore yeah. Yeah, indeed. Because there may be something behind that. Yeah. It may yeah. not have been a brass pin. Yeah. But there may be something behind that. Originally, yeah. yeah. And radiation could have could have been a picture of yeah. some of these sites. And people could have had used that short, sharp burst of radiation um, for healing purposes. Exactly. Uh, and we get on to healing, it's a whole other subject. Maybe oh. we're, and we, we're I mean, we can have go to do on this for, for the rest days. of the year, every Sunday, I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, for sure, we'll we're, for sure we'll do it. We're we're almost out of time. For sure, we'll do it next week at the same yes. time. Yes. And maybe right. we'll have to have another one. I don't know because we've got <laughs> oh, we've got the Holy Wells. We've got Saint Michael's Mount and the Mary Michael Lines. We have Ireland, Loch Crewe, and Malta, and Nidra, we have and, been to Malta and, and then we have Crete, and well, we'll see what happens next week. I'm okay. going to just it, It's because I talk too much. So. Oh, no, no, you don't no. talk too much. That's why I wanted to interview you. I wanted to have this to cherish and to look back on. 
um, because you have so much, so much knowledge and so much uh, passion for for this work, and I just want to share it. Well, thank and I'm you also for gonna, me. I appreciate yeah. it. Well, and I'm also going to say, so your your books are available, and people can contact you at this website, uh, this uh, email, or the website. And uh, I'm also going to add, just for ourselves, that we have also published books on Cornwall uh, that include a number of the sites that we saw, uh, you know, with Cheryl that she was good enough to take us to, and well, also Malta and Ireland. Um, but and our books are also available on Amazon. But I think it's it's this is just talk about it time wars. The time. I mean, it, it's not <laughs> hundreds of years ago. It's just like it's gone in a flash. So can I give a plug for yes. um, uh, just before we go uh, yeah. for you actually, um, Ellen? Um, if you've got access in this country to a TV channel called the Smithsonian TV channel, there's a program on there called Sacred Sight. Sight. Oh uh, yeah. And the, one of the episodes, I think it's series two, episode one, uh, is this one on priestesses uh, at, at ancient sites. And, and Ellen appears on there and has some very interesting things to say. So if you want well, to see that. Well, I up. actually, thank you. It is a, a Smithsonian channel. It is Sacred Sites, the second season. Yeah. And I don't know if it's the first or the second program, I but it was, it was based on the Camino. Yeah, and the since one. my expertise is on the Camino de Santiago, and pilgrimage, yeah. uh, they interviewed me there, and I talked about various things. Yeah. Sitting I in the sand out the there at, the, right. uh, at oh, the, thank uh, you. Uh, sitting in the sand on the beach. I re well yeah. well remember it. Yes, picking up the scallop shell of, <laughs> of Venus that is connected to the community. <laughs> yeah, and it's a very good program on priestess uh, at sacred yes. sites. Well, thank you. Thank you. Bye bye, friends. Well, see you we'll next see you week. next week. Same, time, <laughs> yep. same station. Okay. Bye. Thank okay. you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Mm -hmm.